Welcome to the Commonwealth Policy Center's Legislative Forum. I'm Richard Nelson, Executive Director of CPC, and we're going to talk school choice. With me on this program is State Senator Ralph Alvarado. Uh, Ralph, welcome to the program. Thank you. Appreciate being here. It's hey, always great. You have been an advocate for school choice for several years now. In fact, I think this is one of the uh, issues that's near and dear to your heart. Yeah. Uh, it's an issue that uh, has been quite divisive in Kentucky the last few years, and also in particular this last session. Uh, the Senate passed uh, House Bill 563. It's a bill that uh, originally started out as a provision that allowed parents who wanted to send their children to another public school, but across the county lines or in a different school district. Uh, but since it was introduced in the House, an amendment was attached to it that uh, allowed for what are called educational opportunity accounts. So there's two provisions that allow for choice in Kentucky. But before I ask your comment, I want to cue this up with a little context here. Two, two big points. One is uh, Kentucky, according to 2019 comparisons, educational outcomes compared to other states, we're in the probably the bottom half in the nation. So here, here are some numbers. Kentucky ranked 23rd in fourth grade reading in 2019, 26th in eighth grade reading, 30th in fourth grade math, and 37th in eighth grade math. So three out of four areas there were in the bottom half of the country as far as educational outcomes. It's one consideration. The other is that surrounding states have educational choices for, for parents and their kids. Tennessee, Missouri, uh, West Virginia just passed a comprehensive school choice bill. So when you consider where Kentucky is and you consider where other states are going with this, offering more choices, why has this been such a difficult issue here in Kentucky? I mean, it's, it's a good question. For me, it's not a difficult issue. Uh, I think it's, it makes sense. Um, but we're seeing, I think we've gotten a lot of resistance from the teachers unions out there uh, who just see this as somehow undermining public education. I know we've got some states where uh, these kind of either educational opportunity accounts or scholarship tax credits have been set up. Um, those states do very well. I mean, you take a look at a state like Florida, which has no cap at all on those. They raise almost a half a billion dollars uh, in credits. Their quality rankings for their schools is very high. So the public education system there does very, very well. Uh, and people have an option or a choice. And, and I tell a lot of folks, you know, a lot of our public schools do very well. They do a great job. People yeah. are very happy with it. I know in my district, I've got great schools. They do a great job, hardworking teachers, great superintendents and a lot of parents are very happy. But there's a lot of portions in our state where people don't have that option. And you know, we talk about school choice. Uh, I remind people that school choice already exists in Kentucky if you have the money. Mm -hmm. um, if you're wealthy or you have the ability, that you, can, you can move to any county you want to, you can send your child to any public school you'd want to, you can send them to any private school you'd want to. But the average Kentucky family, either middle, lower, middle income you know, families out there, don't have that option, don't have that choice. Uh, and the unions often will respond by saying, well, find someone who's a wealthy benefactor or somebody in your family who's wealthy to do that for you. That, that sounds very nice, but we know that's not practical. And so this is an opportunity to allow, um, again, these, uh, these kids and families, if they want another choice in education, and after what we've gone through this past year, I think a lot of families are considering that. A lot of them have done um, homeschooling and they've, they've wanted to have perhaps a private option or a non-public option don't have that. And so this is going to give them that opportunity. So the educational opportunity accounts is one of the controversial provisions that the KEA and some legis some educators across the state are opposed to. They're saying that if you create these accounts, which is private monies that goes to a grant making body, and that body would issue grants, scholarships to low and middle income students. Correct. Uh, they're contending that this is somehow going to hurt public education. Is that a valid argument? I don't think it's a valid argument, but that's what they're claiming. And I remind them that the way these EOA accounts or educational opportunity accounts are set up, they can apply either to private or to public schools. So in a public school system could set up a 401c3, raise funds from private monies, and use that to help them with buying supplies, setting up pre-K uh, funding for you know tuition costs for students to come in. So there's a lot of benefits there for both both school systems. So one of the things I'm hearing, Senator Alvarado, is that when you shift kids from within a school district or allow them to go to another school district, it creates instability. The schools have to plan ahead as far as their budgets, how many teachers they need, how many textbooks they need, and it could create some hardship uh, for that given school district if several students leave that 
district. How, how do you respond to that? Well, there's obviously going to be a cap. There's a limit as to what certain schools can take. So it's not like uh, they can say, well, our limit's going to be 1,000 students, but we, we have to take 3,000 and we can't do it. It doesn't work that way. Okay. Uh, there's state and local funding that goes to every student in the public school system. So the state dollars will follow those students to whatever public school they choose to go to. Uh, and then there's um, the local funding, which in the bill, it, it requires for the Department of Education to set up regulations to determine how that money is follows that student through the system. Uh, you'll have to find your own transportation to get to those schools, obviously, if you want that. Um, but obviously, some schools, they receive money based on SEEK formula. So it's a per student, you know, uh, to, what they receive, they, they get money per student there. So if they do very well and they're at maximum capacity, they're going to get the maximum amount of money for that school. It should incentivize poor performing school districts to do better and to try to improve their quality measures to be able to get and attract students to those areas. So. I think it creates a bit of competition amongst public schools for that. Uh, it also, you know, if people want to go to a specific district and just don't happen to live there, they can get their kids to that school. It'll, it should happen. But there's going to be a cap or a limit based on those local schools, so you're not forcing people above that limit. They, they can take what they can accommodate. So e educational opportunity accounts, otherwise known as EOAs, are only eligible or available in counties with more than 150,000 residents. Uh, well, what, what we passed in the recent bill was 90,000 or more, so it'll okay. expand to about eight counties it'll apply to. So that was amended, that mm -hmm. was an amendment added to it, so eight counties would it'd be eligible for. And those are the counties, I'm thinking Jefferson, Fayette, Covington, uh, yes. Kenton County. Kenton County, it'll include also the way it's written right now, Campbell, Boone, Hardin, Warren, and Davies. Those would be the other ones that would be currently in the mix based on that population amount. So, um, you know, again, it, I'd like to see it cover the entire state, to have anybody anywhere in the state. And some say if it's good for a few counties, why not all of them? I would agree. Uh, but, you know, to get some of these bills moving across the finish line, there were some accommodations that had to be made. This is one of the stipulations the House required in order to get this across the finish line. Senator Alvarado, I've been on the phone with several uh, House members uh, that voted against this and trying to understand better what was their, why were they opposed to it. Uh, one, uh, I think, a, a valid argument was that in some of their, with the open borders part, um, which is a derogatory, I think they're meant to be a derogatory term, uh, but where parents can choose to send their child to another school district uh, that could create a hardship for some of the smaller school districts uh, that could in, that could lose a number of students that create that instability. You would just address that, that uh, there is a stopgap there, yep. that they will not allow that to happen. But that is a belief that a number of legislators have, and that was one reason why they voted against this. Um, what would you say to them? I mean, how would you, you – know, I've heard from a handful of people today talking about this, that that's the concern. They don't want to see that open borders provision there. How, how and, would you? and again, I, I, I would just argue that, you know, people have a, you know, should have a right to choose where their kids go to school, the type of education they can receive. Um, and to think that just the boundaries of your, where you live at is going to limit that. Again, if you're wealthy, you can move to that area. If you're not wealthy, you don't have that option to say that's only going to apply. For me, it's almost discriminatory to say you've got to have money to be able to get your kid into that district so you can go to that school. And if you don't, then you're out of luck, you know? And if you're not happy with where you're going, you don't have an option to go somewhere else that might be a higher performing school or might be a better fit for your student or whatever it is that it drives that choice for you as a parent. So uh, I think that's what's important about allowing that. One of the big arguments is that, and I'm gonna bounce back to the EOAs, uh, that this is gonna drain money from the public schools. Uh, here's what the Kenton County Education Association said. Considering Kentucky's public schools have been underfunded in every budget since 2008, funding HB 563 is literally stealing money, literally stealing money, is what they said, from public school children of our Commonwealth. The $25 million in tax credits could be used to fund textbooks, professional development, and all the things that have been cut over the past years. We must ensure a quality public education for our students. That starts with a veto of this bad bill by Governor Bashir. And by the way, uh, it's expected as we record this program that Governor Bashir is going to veto this bill. How do you respond to this, that it's about money, uh, that this is stealing money from the public school okay. children? It's a, it's a complete falsehood. So uh, our public schools in state dollars get $3.5 billion per year. That's with a B. They're about to receive about $2.4 billion additional federal funds from the stimulus mm -hmm. program. So that's going to be about roughly combined almost $6 billion they're going to be receiving. And we're talking $25 million in this, these EOAs, 
Uh, that can be used for private or public schools both. So not all going necessarily to private schools. It could be used for public schools as well. That's a 250, 260 to one ratio in funding. We are at an all time high in funding in the SEEK formula per pupil ever in the state of Kentucky, $4,000 per student every year that comes through. So to say that we're horribly underfunded is inadequate. It's, it's, it's an inaccurate statement. Also, most, when you compare to other states, yeah. most states will, compare, will combine not just what we put into the educational system, but also what we apply to teacher salaries and retirement as a combined amount. Yeah. And if you do that in Kentucky, we are very high because we're putting a ton of money into teachers' pensions and retirement systems as, as a result of that too. So that's not an accurate statement. There's no stealing of funds. These are private monies. People are allotted a 95% tax credit on those funds going in, and they can be used again for private uh, public schools. And it's also based on a lottery system. You cannot designate that money for a particular school or for a particular student. The, the, the granting organization takes those children in. A certain percentage have to be within a, a poverty range so those kids to be eligible, and then they designate those funds on a lottery system. So th there's no way to control that, and there's no stealing of funds from the public education system. Just one more comment here, and then we're almost at the end of the program, uh, Senator Alvarado, but this is from the Campbell County Education Association asking for Governor Bashir to veto House Bill 563, and they say that there are, Campbell County has multiple school choice options available, but only one choice provides an appropriate education for every child. The public school system is the only school system that welcomes all children. Private schools can reject children with special behavioral or educational resources, and public tax money should only go to schools that accept all students. Uh, and then they went, they went on to talk about being underfunded. How do you respond to that, that some of the private schools can reject special needs students? That is an argument that I've heard as well yeah. in other places. I, I don't, I mean, again, I, I went to private schools. That wasn't the case. Children weren't rejected based on how, I mean, I've gotten emails that say they're going to be rejected because of their appearance. I, I'm, a, I'm a Brown student who was, uh, went to a private school. I went to public school for a while, then went to private later. Um, you know, no one said, hey, your skin is an adequate color or, hey, you've got a disability or some other reason that they're not going to take you. We have non-public schools that are dedicated to children with autism who do nothing but that mm -hmm. for a living. And, and there's parents who want them to go to that specialized school for autistic kids. So, again, th these are disingenuous comments just to create division. They're not accurate. Um, and, and to think that there's only one choice and that some individuals know what that choice is for every child is not how we should be approaching American students and Kentucky students. Yeah, very good point. So there are private schools for special needs students where this money could be used, the parents could use that to help meet the needs of their special oh, sure. needs students. Jefferson County has a school, uh, an autism school dedicated to kids with autism. That's all they do. Uh, and parents try desperately to get their children there. It's not the cheapest right. school to go to, but they're, they're completely... Uh, dedicated to, to treating, uh, it's not to treating, but to teaching children with autism and their needs and handling those kids in a, in a good setting. So there's people that choose that. That would be an opportunity for them to use those funds as well. Senator Alvarado, we have 30 seconds. Uh, this bill is going to be vetoed, apparently going to be vetoed by Governor Bashir. What would you say to your colleagues during the veto override session in a couple days? What would you tell them, those who are on the, on the fence with this issue? Yeah, I, I would tell them that you know, school choice is crucial. This is a fundamental uh, thing. I think everybody, again, we want to be able to treat all children the same way. Uh, only the wealthy right now in Kentucky have that option. And if we want to keep up with our neighboring states, is to be able to give every child that choice and that option to decide what's best for them and their families. Uh, we're not doing anything to, help, to hurt the public system. We're protecting our public school system and allowing these funds to be used for both. So if public schools need more funding for technology, for uh, for pre-K uh, teaching, for lots of other services, textbooks, these funds can be used for that purpose as well. Very good. Senator Ralph Alvarado, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. My mother was always very familiar with her neighborhood, but one day she stopped at the stop sign for much longer than usual, and uh, she didn't know whether she should go forward or, or turn, and she wasn't even really sure where she was at. It was very unsettling for her. I felt so much better after my son told me, Mom, I don't want you to worry or be afraid. I'll be there for you and we'll figure it out. Hi, Richard Nelson here with the Commonwealth Policy Center. If you're feeling frustrated over the direction of our nation, the leadership in Washington, D.C., the Equality Act, don't stay in your frustration. Do something about it. Get plugged into the Commonwealth Policy Center. Go to our website and sign up for our newsletter. Be informed, be encouraged, sign up now. Go to commonwealthpolicycenter.org.
Welcome to the Commonwealth Policy Center's Legislative Forum. I'm Richard Nelson, Executive Director of CPC, and today we're going to talk about the Youth Health Protection Act. And with me to talk about this important bill in the state legislature is State House Member Savannah Maddox. Savannah, it's good to have you in the program. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it, Richard. Yeah, so you introduced House Bill 336 uh, earlier this session. Actually, you introduced it last year as well, a similar provision. And uh, let me tee this up by just giving some context to this. Uh, we, live in a, we live in a time where uh, many of our young people are told that they can determine their own gender. If they are feeling gender dysphoria, when, when they are not, their psychology is not um, it, it, compatible or not, not in sync with their biological gender, but their biological sex, um, it's okay to embrace what their psychology tells them, what their mind is telling them. And this is quite a new phenomena. It's a new um, thing, but yet it's, it's real. Uh, there are young people that are struggling with this, and I want to be sensitive at the outset and not dismiss some of the struggles that our young people are facing because this is a real issue, and I don't want to minimize that at all. But your bill, uh, House Bill 336, addresses whether or not it's appropriate for caregivers of these children, of minor children, to make life-altering decisions. Uh, and according to the bill, it says that medical professionals c will not be able to perform surgery or pre prescribe medication to facilitate the minor's desire to present or appear in a manner that is inconsistent with that, that minor's sex. Um, what prompted you to to introduce this bill last year and again this year? Yes, absolutely, Richard. Essentially, what I have discovered over the course of the past two years mm -hmm. is that not just in Kentucky, but across the nation, um, it is possible and is occurring that children under the age of 18 are receiving cross-sex hormones as mm -hmm. well as puberty blocking treatments to allow them to transition their gender from their natal sex into the opposite gender. and. Uh, Back in 2019, I recall hearing about a case in Texas with a seven-year-old child mm. whose parents were engaged in a brutal custody um, war over the child, but one of the issues that had arisen was that the child was being transitioned. And at that moment in time, it was about, you know, who has the authority to allow this child to transition, the mother or the father, because yeah. the father said, no, this is a young man. He's always been a young man. And yeah. the mother said that this young man was transitioning to a female and had experienced gender dysphoria. Mm -hmm. So the question in my mind that arose from that is, under what circumstances should parents of minor children ever be able to transition their child, or more importantly, to allow a physician to prescribe puberty blocking treatments or cross-sex hormones because none of those treatments are FDA approved for children. And you know, again, like you said, it, it's very important to me to, to not dismiss the experiences of children who are confused because there can be a whole host of reasons that children get these ideas or these feelings in their head. Some of them are born out of the media that they're watching, social media, peer groups, things of that nature, stuff they're seeing on TV. But then other things can pertain to trauma that they've experienced. But the bottom line is these children, they need to proceed, they need to receive counseling and professional help to deal with these issues. They do need to be reaffirmed in their worth, in their value, and in their merit, but also in their innate gender that is part of their biology, yeah. not to transition that away from them. Yeah, so this is a, uh, this is, you're talking about somebody's feelings, which, and their psycho psychological state, mm -hmm. which is changes. Your, our feelings change, our psychology changes, but gender, our, our and gender and sex actually have two different <laughs> meanings, yes. but our biological sex is probably the better way to put it. Mm -hmm. Gender is goes along with the, your biological sex. Um, but here we're talking about a minor child that uh, is not fully grown. Their mind is still developing, even in their mid-20s. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question is, is, should a minor child be allowed to make that decision? And should the parents or caregivers of that child be allowed to make that decision, and this bill would say no, that they cannot do that because they cannot 
truly consent and with the full knowledge of what they're doing. And that's just the thing. You know, no aspect of this bill is going to interfere with parents' rights in so much as they have the ability to raise their children how they see fit and to seek treatment, whether it's to affirm the gender dysphoria or to treat it or to do whatever they need to do to get their child on the right path. However, administering cross-sex hormones or puberty blocking treatments to children who are under age 18, knowing that in the vast majority of cases, when puberty is allowed to take place like normal, these children grow out of it and they do accept and embrace their biological gender because we talk about gender being assigned at birth. No, it's in every one of our cells, even the cells in our brain. We either have chromosomes that are XX or XY. And so we need to get to a place where we are supporting these children who are experiencing these symptoms and uh, and also achieving a lifelong resolution as opposed to just, you know, in many instances rendering them sterile. That's one of, there's a huge human rights implication here for mm -hmm. these children because mm -hmm. these decisions are being made uh, sometimes as early as nine and 11 years old when they first start receiving the puberty blocking treatments and then the hormonal transition therapy, you're taking away what could be the most important days of their life. I know for me as a mother, the two most important days mm. of my whole life is when I brought my children into this mm. world and to think that based on a difficult time in a child's life, which is confusing for so many of us adolescents, yes. that we're gonna take away that moment from that potential mom or dad it's wrong and we need to pause, we need to be mindful, and we need to engage the medical community in ways that we can support these children without making life-altering decisions for them. Yeah, that's a good point. There was a study done several years ago by a uh, psychiatrist at Johns Hopkins, or at least that he um, referenced, and his name escapes me, but uh, he indicated that upwards of 80% of gender dysphoric teenagers and young adults, by the time they reach their 30s, will embrace their biological sex. Yes. Um, so they've gotten through that period of dysphoria and their uh, psychological state aligns with their biological reality. Uh, can, there are no other states that have enacted legislation like this, however, uh, Alabama just recently, their state senate just recently voted 23 to 4 to approve a very a similar bill to what we're talking about here. Uh, their state house approved something similar. It's in reconciliation now, so perhaps Alabama uh, could be the first state. I think the South Carolina, one of their chambers, uh, made uh, a move forward on something like this as well. Um, so, uh, what are the prospects of this actually? happening in the future there's we're out of time this session and it's not yes. going to happen this year it wasn't even assigned to a committee um, what's it going to take for kentucky to for the kentucky legislature to move ahead on this i think that what i have sought to do over the past couple of years is to amplify the voices of people who have been harmed by this issue mm -hmm. of parents of children who have been faced with these decisions and have felt pressure on behalf of unproven science because the science is not settled on this issue on behalf of practitioners who have pushed them in a certain direction to elevate their voices to the General Assembly to make them understand that this is not a function of trying to engage in any type of discriminatory practice, whether rather to give Kentucky's children who are suffering from these issues the tools that they need to succeed. One of the things that is typically used um, as an argument in favor of gender transition is the increased suicidality um, among children who are experiencing this. But in reality, folks who undergo transition later on in life they are 20 times more likely yeah. Yeah. to end their lives. Yeah. So this is not just a human rights issue, but this is something that we need to do to protect families here in Kentucky. Yeah, no, that's a good point. We actually interviewed Dr. Julie Hamilton, who's a clinical psychologist, and she talked about that myth um, where there was a study that tried to purport that um, gender dysphoric youth are more suicidal, and they, they twisted it. They cherry-picked some of it. And actually, to your point, they're more likely to commit suicide if they go through with the gender transition, if I remember what she was saying correctly. And I'm, uh, so very different than what we're told. You know, we're supposed to, and by the way, Savannah, I know that you care about Kentucky. You care about your constituency. I care about Kentucky. And I care about those who are struggling with this issue, gender dysphoria. And it's a question of which path forward. How do we help people who are struggling? What is good policy for our young people, minor children, who really don't know any better? 
And um, I'd like to move to a case. We've got just a few minutes here, but I want to um, point out a case in Ohio where parents of a 17-year-old girl who wanted to transition, uh, the parents said, no, we're not going to let you do this. She sued them in court, and a judge took that 17-year-old daughter out of their parents' home and gave her to their grandparents, to her grandparents. Uh, made national news, but this is an issue. I'm wondering if this is something that's come into um, your view as far as does this need to be addressed? I mean, parents losing their kids. This is a minor. 17-year-old is still a minor. Absolutely. Wow. Whenever I first filed this piece of legislation last session, um, a friend of mine who has also worked on policy asked me to sit down and meet with the physician who leads a gender transition clinic right here in Kentucky. And in the context of those conversations, she openly revealed the fact that she wants it to where minor children, not only do they have the ability to receive these types of unproven, non-FDA approved treatments, she wants them to be able to do it without their parents' consent. Mm. And it was mm. extremely troubling. So yes, we absolutely need to address that. Are, are we aware of any cases where um, healthcare workers, pharmacists, doctors could be forced by parents or a, a, a guardian to dispense drugs or to do a transition surgery? Are we aware of, is this? That's a situation that I've also sought to address legislatively in so much as you do not want any type of reprisal to occur if a person in their sincerely held beliefs does not believe yeah. in providing those services for anyone, even folks mm -hmm. over the age of 18, because we don't want to use the force of government to uh, force people to engage in decision making or provide services that aren't in accordance with their beliefs. So I could see where that would happen and it's something that we need to be looking at. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a statement from Ryan Anderson. We hear, and we've got just a minute and a half, we hear a lot about science denier. Um, so this is what Ryan Anderson, who's a, an authority on the transgender issue, he said, even if trans activists could answer these questions about feelings, that still wouldn't address the matter of reality. Why should feeling like a man, whatever that means, make someone a man? Why do our feelings determine reality on the question of sex, but on little else? Our feelings don't determine our age or our height. Uh, so somebody might feel very strongly about this, that, that I'm really a man trapped in a woman's body or vice versa. Um, how do we address overcoming somebody's feelings? We do live in a post-truth age, by sure. the way. And that's, that's part of the issue. We do such a great disservice to lend credibility to ideas and beliefs that are harmful to people. And I think that what we can do as individuals is to speak the truth in love and to affirm a difficulty that someone's experiencing while not allowing them to cause harm to themselves yeah in that belief. So I think that that's what we need to do, not just in the context of legislators, but every one of us. Yeah, that's a good final word to close on. State Representative Savannah Maddox, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, Richard, thank you. And thank you for tuning in to the Commonwealth Policy Center's Legislative Forum.